I know that we don't win this thing unless we persuade every or the majority, great majority of American parents that they have more to gain and their children are going to be safer in a world in which the criminal justice system plays a less and less and more and more reduced role in dealing with drugs in our society. I know that when I'm speaking with African-American communities, what's important to, to bring home there? Of course, they get it about crack powder and the, the, the injustice of the, of the racial disparities and the disproportionality of the arrests and the per persecution and prosecution of young black, brown, and men and the, and the problems with, you know, not, ju not just driving while black, but walking while black or even running while black, God forbid, right? I mean, I know that, that that's a part of it. But when some come back and say, well, I just want the laws to be enforced equally, no, that's not sufficient. That's not sufficient. And we should not, and they cannot, we cannot accept the notion that somehow there's an underlying legitimacy to these laws in the first place. I mean, somehow we tend to think that back 50, 100 years ago, that some independent commissions were established that concluded that, 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 that well, these drugs should be legal and these drugs should be illegal. Alcohol and cigarettes, yeah, we have the experience with alcohol prohibition, but yeah, you know, and these ones, well, marijuana, cocaine, how and more. What is the fact? If you ask how and why was that distinction made, and when you look carefully at the history, and when you realize the sort of Monty Python nature of the legislative deliberations that led to these criminalizations in the first place a hundred years ago, what you realize is that the distinction between which drugs should be legal and which drugs should be illegal had essentially nothing to do with the relative dangers of these drugs and almost everything to do with who used these drugs and who was perceived to use these drugs. So that when the principal users of opiate drugs in America in the 1870s and 80s were primarily middle class white women in the South, taking opium and laudanum form, other forms for menopause, aches and pains, there was no aspirin, there was no Motrin, right? People had diarrhea, bad sanitation, opium was great for that. Nobody thought to criminalize Grandma, or our auntie. But when the Chinese came over, working 100 hours a week on the railroads and in the mines and what have you, going back to their dormitories in the night, smoking up that opium pipe just as they had in the old country, and people started to worry, what would that Chinaman with his opium done do to our precious white women, seducing them and raking them and addicting them? That's when we got the first criminal laws prohibiting the opiates in, China, in California and Nevada in the 1870s and 1880s. The first anti-cocaine laws were directed at blacks, at black men, at Negroes, working on the docks in the South. And the fear was, what would that black man do when he took that white powder up his nose? What might he do to our precious white women? The first anti-marijuana laws were in the teens and the 20s in the Midwest and the Southwest, directed at Mexican-Americans, Mexican migrants coming up, taking the good jobs from the good white people, going back home, smoking up a little of that funny smell, funny smelling, you know, reefer cigarette. And the fear was, once again, what would those darker-skinned people do to our precious women and children? I mean, quite frankly, even alcohol prohibition was to some extent a conflict between the white, white Americans and the not-so-white, white Americans, right? The white, white Americans who came in the 18th and 19th century from northern Western Europe and the not-so-white, white Americans coming from southern Europe and eastern Europe in the late 19th century, early 20th century with their beer and their vino and their schlivowitz, right? Flooding into the American cities, scaring people with their habits and their... Right? And in fact, the, the good white, white people knew that when we had prohibition, alcohol prohibition, it wouldn't really stop them from drinking. They would still be able to drink. It would inevitably be the case that the enforcement of the laws would be directed at others. When African-American church leaders advocated for alcohol prohibition because they perceived the evils of alcohol, and then they got what they wanted in the form of an 18th Amendment prohibiting alcohol, and then when those laws were disproportionately enforced against African-American people, people eventually woke up. There has never been a medical reason for criminalizing marijuana. I, I, I look through the history of this if you're interested. I don't know if you want me to run through it, but it's an interesting history. Uh, marijuana, marijuana was criminalized. See, very commonly, uh, substances are criminalized because they're associated with what were called the, which are called the dangerous classes. You know, poor people or working people. So, for example, in England in the 19th century, uh, there was a period when gin was criminalized and whiskey wasn't, because gin is what poor people drink. That's kind of like the sentencing for crack and powder. You know. uh, when in the early stages of prohibition in the United States, uh, 
one of the targets was immigrant immigrant workers. You know, these guys hanging around the saloons in New York. Got to go after them. Um, the rich guys in upstate New York, they're going to drink no matter what. You know, they want to come home after work, they'll drink. But go after those guys. What about marijuana? The marijuana was brought in by Mexicans. Uh, and the first criminalization of marijuana was in the southwest, in the states. It was in uh, New Mexico, later Utah, and so on. And it was specifically targeted against Mexicans. Uh, it didn't get criminalized in the United States until shortly after Prohibition ended. <coughs> after Prohibition ended, we had this huge Bureau of Narcotics, and they had to do something. Uh, so they discovered you know, that marijuana is going to do all kind of horrible things to you. The Senate testimony about this is mind-boggling. Uh, there was the, there was, they did have a, a representative of the American Medical Association who said, we don't have any medical evidence about him, about this. He was shut up, denounced, you know, they got rid of him right away. Uh, then they found somebody else. This, this is literally true. They found a pharmacologist, a guy teaching at Temple University, uh, who was using mar- who was doing experiments with marijuana and dogs. Okay. And they brought this guy in to test. The testimony is hilarious. You, know? you really have to read it. They brought this guy in. He testified that when he gave marijuana to dogs, they went insane. You know, they did all kind of things. Uh, and then the uh, some senator or somebody asked him. This is from memory. So it's probably a little off, but something like this. I was in the 30s. They asked the guy, "Well, have you ever tried marijuana on humans?" So he said, "Yeah, I tried it on itself." And he said, well, what happened? He said, I turned into a vulture. I started flying around the room. So they uh, said, oh, my God, this stuff is terrible. It makes people insane. And uh, marijuana, it was declared by Congress that marijuana makes people insane. But then something happened. It turned out that lawyers, defense lawyers, got the idea, okay, I can use this for an insanity defense. So if a guy was found, you know, who killed three cops, uh, his lawyer would say, well, you know, he had a, he had marijuana before, so he was insane, so he can't do anything. And people were getting off on uh, charges, you know, like cop killing, for example, uh, be- on, the, on the claim that they had marijuana. So all of a sudden it was discovered that marijuana doesn't make you insane. Congress decided, sorry, it doesn't make you insane because we want to wipe that out. Uh, the next idea was marijuana is an entry drug. It's the drug you take and then you go on to something else. Well, there was never any evidence for that. Uh, but that was decided. And then in the early 50s, something else happened. Marijuana is being brought in here by red Chinese to poison the American population and destroy us. You know. So therefore, we've got to stop marijuana. And it kind of goes on like this. Actually, the peak of marijuana use was, as I said, in the 70s. But that was rich kids. So you don't throw them in jail. You know. And then it got seriously criminalized. You, know, you, you really throw people in jail for it when it was poor people. I mean, that's roughly the history. The detailed history is quite interesting. Anslinger tells Congress that school children are using marijuana. That assertion results in the only testimony against the law. Dr. William Woodward of the American Medical Association testifies that for all the complaints about marijuana's danger to school children, there was no evidence to back it up. Congress disregards his testimony. They just attacked him viciously. They said, how can you come down here trying to interrupt us when we're trying to do something good for the American people and so forth? Well, it turns out their argument with him had nothing to do with marijuana. They just chopped him into pieces and verbally uh, excoriated him in front of this congressional hearing and then lied about what he said. Hearst follows the hearings, adding extra newspaper runs to cover the news in Washington and headlining the evils of marijuana. Across America, independent movies add to the propaganda, bombarding the public. The most famous, Reefer Madness, warns of the perils of smoking marijuana, as stated by Anslinger and Hearst. Didn't come from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, but Anslinger's Bureau did endorse it. He did support it. In fact, in the opening scene, when uh, the high school principal is talking to an audience of parents, he refers to the Bureau of Narcotics uh, several times. On Capitol Hill, Anslinger wins. Congress passes the Marijuana Tax Act, the first federal law against the drug. The Southwest gets the federal law they wanted. After five days of hearings, the Marijuana Tax Law goes to Congress for a vote. It's passed within weeks by roll call vote. 
President Roosevelt signs the bill on August 2nd. It takes effect October 1st. Perhaps one of Anslinger's most significant contributions to fighting drugs is that he, more than any other individual, demonized drugs. I don't know that Anslinger lied to Congress, but he was an effective propagandist, we might say. The law requires that anyone wishing to buy, sell, distribute, or transfer marijuana must pay a tax and have a stamp. The penalty for failure to do so is five years in jail, a $2,000 fine, or both. But like the machine gun law, the government doesn't make the marijuana stamps available. There was another problem, too, and that was that in order to get the license, you had to have the marijuana in hand. But if you had the marijuana in hand without the license, you had already violated the law. Two days after the law goes into effect, the first offender of the Marijuana Tax Act, Samuel Caldwell, is arrested in Colorado. Four days later, he is convicted and sentenced to four years in jail and a $1,000 fine. Anslinger flies in from Washington to see justice done. So begins the federal government's effort to punish marijuana users. One year after its ban, Anslinger's law runs into a powerful critic. It was none other than the mayor of America's biggest metropolitan city, Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia of New York. LaGuardia commissions a group of medical professionals from the New York Academy of Medicine to study his city's marijuana problem. This blue ribbon panel visits schoolyards, interviews principals, even tests the effects of the drug on adults. After four years of study, the following conclusions are drawn. Smoking marijuana does not lead to addiction. Marijuana smoking is not widespread among school children. Marijuana is not a determining factor in major crimes. Publicity concerning the catastrophic effects of marijuana use in New York City is unfounded. Ironically, LaGuardia obtained the pot used in his study from Anslinger. And then when the LaGuardia report came out, Anslinger felt betrayed. In over 10,000 years of recorded human history, the plant we call marijuana, or hemp, has served mankind. From it we made paper, fabric, rope, and fuel. And like fire and water, it helped us climb the ladder of civilization. One fortunate, harmless side effect was the fact that it contained a chemical called THC, which, if ingested, would make humans feel good. Many people assume hemp was made illegal through some kind of process involving science, medical, or government hearings in order to protect the citizens from what was determined to be a dangerous drug. Well, not at all. Here's what really happened. In the 1930s, investor publisher William Randolph Hearst invested heavily in thousands of acres of timberland to make paper. But at the same time, Hearst's tree paper was in direct competition with the established hemp paper. And Hearst was also in the business of printing newspapers. So, Hearst joined forces with the DuPont Company, who, by the way, was developing a fabric called nylon, which was in direct competition with hemp cloth. Together, they would cook up a scheme to take hemp completely off the market so their individual enterprises could flourish. While the DuPont Company relentlessly lobbied Washington with clever propaganda, Hearst began a racist smear campaign printed in his many newspapers to convince common Americans that hemp, or marijuana, was an evil drug. Enter the extremely ambitious Harry J. Anslinger, America's first head of the Bureau of Narcotics. At the time, he was pushing for a restriction on opiates and cocaine, but it would certainly help to build his career and his agency if he added marijuana to that short list. After all, Hearst and DuPont had done an excellent job with their propaganda. Marijuana influences Negroes to look at white people in the eye, step on white men's shadows, and look at a white woman twice. The rest is an embarrassing and dismal history. The demonizing of marijuana is wrong, inaccurate, and harmful. On November 2nd, we Californians will have an opportunity to reverse this monumental mistake. Vote yes on Prop 19.